information, and so you can take a look at this information and say, I'm going to try to be as general as I can with universities and colleges, but I will lean, as you probably figured, more heavily on some Waterloo examples. But I will address some of the things that are going to be common, whether it is college or university. I'm going to talk about all of the resources that are available to you. So there will be OSAP, scholarships, bursaries, um, what the expectation is as far as you contributing to your education and the expectations surrounding parents and contributing to your post-secondary education as well. So when we talk about how much it will cost, these are the projected costs for eight months at the University of Waterloo. The range is an arts, science, environment program at the $6,600 or $3,300 a term. That's the tuition. The higher end is the engineering program or computer science programs. Now this is an eight-month cost for tuition. We do bill a term at a time. Depending on the institution you plan to attend, you may find that you are faced with these costs once in the fall and then once again in the winter. So if I could have a show of hands just quickly, do we have people who know where they're going to be in the fall? Have they made their decisions? Excellent. Are you going to be attending college or university? Okay. University. There's the answer I wanted to hear. No, that's great. Yep, University of Waterloo. Do we have any other institutions? Where are you planning to attend? Yeah. Conestoga, perfect. Anybody else want to volunteer? Yep. At Laurier. Perfect. Okay, so some of these things from a university perspective are going to be fairly common. Um, when we take a look at books and supplies, again an eight month cost, so about a thousand dollars a term. When you take a look at traditional residence, and what we mean by traditional residence is that you are sharing a room or you have a single room and there is a place where you would go, like a cafeteria or lounge, etc., for your meals. There will be common study student spaces, but you will have a, a single room or a double room where you're sharing in a large area. So you, you can factor that into be about $11,000 for the eight months. If you opt for a suite style residence, that is the one in there. These are common at institutions across Ontario, where you've got um, four people living in an apartment style. Where you've each got your own bedroom, but you've got shared living space, and you have a shared kitchen, and you have the opportunity to cook your own meals. At University of Waterloo, first year residence is guaranteed, and you have your choice of being um, putting the information in there as to how, how, what kind of residence you would like. And you'll find a similar kind of questionnaire that, if it hasn't already come out, will be coming out when it talks about residence plans. The difference in the price is that the meal plan for a traditional residence is required. For the suite style residence, you can buy into an optional meal plan, but then you've got that opportunity to make your own food and to have your, your information there. Then we talk about transportation, entertainment, your cell phone, all of those things can add another $3,200. So when you add all of that up on the lower end of the scale, you're looking at about $21,700. At the higher end of the scale, it's up over $32,000. So those numbers, while not meant to be scary, are meant to just give you an idea of what one year or eight months would be at, say, the University of Waterloo in a post-secondary institution. So now when we take a look at all of the resources, you're going to quickly realize that there's going to have to be a number of different things that you may have to put in play to help meet those costs. So one of the things I like to do in that area is really encourage you to create a budget, to do your research when you're there at your school and at the website to say, okay, what is, what is my program? What is it going to cost? What are all of these other things that I think I'm, I want to be able to spend my funds on? Am I going to be coming back and forth, back home? How many times am I going to do that on a, a week, a month, et cetera? So factoring on all of these costs, and then you start taking a look at what do I have in the resources columns. So when I take a look at that, we'll talk about OSAP. So OSAP is Ontario Student Assistance Program. It is funded by both the federal and the provincial governments. And I see a little bit of the formatting is off based on 
my uh, version of, of PowerPoint and the others, but I think you can get the, the feel for this one. So, important to note that OSAP is funded by both the federal and the provincial government. There are different sets of monies available to you and different sets of rules, whether it's federal or provincial, and that's important to note. The Ontario Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities has got their main office in Thunder Bay, and they are responsible for the program design, getting the application available to you, the back end things, all of the forms, etc. You'd be dealing, though, with the financial aid office at the institution you plan to attend. That's your face for OSAP and then anything that is provided by the institution when it comes to scholarships, bursaries, etc. So that's mostly who you'll be dealing with. But another partner to note is the National Student Loan Service Center. And that is the organization that looks after the administration and distribution of your OSAP funds. And they will be the organization you'll be dealing with when it comes time to pay your student loans. After you've finished your program at a post-secondary institution, they will be the ones you'll be dealing with. So you'll be setting up your online account with the National Student Loan Service Center and then updating them throughout your uh, academic career. So, OSAP provides needs-based assistance through grants and loans to help qualified students and their families with post-secondary costs. Grants, something you don't have to pay back. That's considered non-repayable aid. You keep that money, you don't have to worry about that. Then there's the loan portion of the OSAP. That, that would be something you would have to pay back, but do keep in mind that it is interest-free, payment-free while you are a student, continuing to study on a full-time basis. So to be eligible for OSAP, you must be a Canadian citizen, permanent resident, protected person. You have to reside in Ontario. Each province has their own set of rules as far as residency is concerned. So you're considered, if you live here in Ontario, you're considered an Ontario resident, and you would apply for OSAP. Even if you were planning to attend an institution outside of Ontario, if you wanted to go to school, say, in Manitoba or out west, you would still apply to OSAP because that is your province of residency. It has to be an approved OSAP program and school, and you have to be enrolled in a program that leads to a certification or a diploma, like a qualification at the end of it. So if you're enrolled in a certificate program, a diploma program, or something with a degree, that is considered a program that is eligible for OSAP assistance. And it needs to be a minimum 12 weeks in length which is not an issue for most university and college programs. I touched on this a bit. If you're planning to study outside of Ontario, so you can still apply for full OSAP assistance, both federal and provincial money, if you're planning to study outside of Ontario. Picking any school within Canada, you still have the uh, full suite of OSAP options available to you. If you're choosing to apply and go outside of the country, outside of Canada, you would be eligible for only the federal portion. And when we take a look at that split, that's usually the 60% part of what your total entitlement might be. So if those options are available, it's something you're considering later on. On the OSAP website, there is this estimator, and it can it's a very quick way to give you an idea of how much you might be eligible for as far as OSAP is concerned. Now, have, has anyone started their OSAP application online? So, see a few hands? Okay, perfect. We'll go through for the rest of you what it is you're going to need to start that. But this is a quick way to just find out what am I going to be eligible for. So you can see, I don't know, see that you're being asked, am I currently still in high school? So you would answer that one, yes. Um, parental income is done in installments, so 50000 70000 90,000, they have those increments on there. So you would take your parents' income from their tax returns and put that amount in there. You're going to specify in that lighter green area what program you're going into. Am I going into university or am I going into college? Am I going into a grad program or an undergrad program? All of that is there. And whether or not you're going to live at home. And then the last box is, am I attending school outside of Ontario? So a few quick little things to fill out, and it'll give you back right away an estimate 
based on the income range of what you might be eligible for in both grants and loans. The OSAP application itself is going to get the same kind of questions, but in way more detail. So a quick way would be able to take a look at, at this information. So when you're applying for OSAP, the OSAP website is listed there. But we recommend a deadline of June 15th. That's only to be able to make sure from a Waterloo perspective and for some other institutions that you've got all of your OSAP and a funding summary in place so that you can do something about the fees and the fee bill that your post-secondary institution is going to be producing for you. It gives your application a chance to process. It gives the supporting documents, which I'll get into, a chance to process so that you get a funding summary in the end that you can actually work with. You can complete the application in stages. So if you've got a bit of your information first, you could start your application, you could log in, you can get to a point, save it, log out, and then go check with you on your income side. Go check what you might have um, for the tax return information. Once you've got all of the information in the various stages, then you submit the application. But don't feel that you have to start it and completely go all the way through it in order to submit the application. It can be done there. Funds are released starting recommendation law applications. So what we say to do that by June is that you have everything in place so that when the schools want to be able to get the money out, to pay the fees, to get the money to you, you'll be able to have that done right in September. That's not to say that the OSAP deadline is in, in the summer, in June. You can apply well into the school year. If you thought you were going to be okay, and then you've made the choice to go, no, I think I should really apply for OSAP. I've done the estimator. I can, I'm entitled to some funds. You can still do that and, and check on the website. It depends on the end of your program in first year as to whether or not what your deadline will be. You need to apply for OSAP every year. One application just doesn't start the stage and then assess you for all of the years within your academic program. One of the important things to note that when you do complete your application, hand in supporting documents and you get a funding summary, you can at that choice and time say, I only want to take the grant money. I only want to take the money that I don't have to pay back. So you can log on to your account on the OSAP website and tick the box that says I want grant only. And what it does, it keeps your assessment still intact, but it only disperses the grant money when we do as an institution the authorization to actually have the money released. What's important to note that if sometime within that study period you've decided that you want the loans to be released, all you have to do is go back on to your account on the OSAP website, tick, take the tick out of the box, and then the loan money will be dispersed as well. Two of the concepts that the um, Ontario government is putting in place are things to be able to help you with your decisions for post-secondary, etc. So you may have heard, or they may refer to it as net estimates and net billing. So net estimates is what you may see if you've gone on the OSAP website, haven't quite decided yet where you're planning to go. So you put in a couple of OSAP applications. I put in one for Waterloo, I put in one for Conestoga, and I put in one for Laurier, because I haven't really decided yet. So your OSAP applications will assess and will give you three different funding amounts. And that's what they call the net estimates part of it. If you've um, got that detail, so you can take a look and say, okay, here's my assessment at these three institutions. Or let's say I was going to live at home here and I was just going to commute back to the school. But if I'm going to go to the University of Ottawa, I know that I'm going to be living away from home. And how much OSAP might I get in that stage? So the opportunity is there for you to be able to submit more than one OSAP application and see those comparisons and make that difference. This was a big piece of the former Ontario government's plans when they released the OSAP application last year in November. They tied it in with applying through um, UAC for admission to universities or the appropriate college uh, application center as well. 
And so they wanted the OSAP application and information out and available early to help students make decisions as they approached the June 3rd deadline, which is your decision in which to say where you, which, whose offer you're going to accept and where you're going to go. Net billing was the other initiative, and you'll see this on the um, bills that you receive from the institution. What, it, what the Ontario government wanted to make sure is that if a student was being billed X number of dollars for their tuition, any financial aid that they were entitled to, scholarships, bursaries, OSAP, would be accounted in that billing, so the student paid only the difference if anything was left over to pay. Rather than a student paying the full thing up front and then getting reimbursed when the scholarships were released or the bursaries were released or the OSAP money deposited in the bank account. So they wanted to ensure that students were paying only the smaller amount or, or no amount if they had to at the time when the fee bills went out to make it easier for students. So, the information needed for your OSAP application. You're going to start it off, you're going to log in, you're going to give in your social insurance number, they're going to ask you for a password, they'll assign you an, an OSAP access number, and it'll be that access number and your password that you will use to log into that site again and again and again. You'll start then your application, you'll give profile information first, which is like date of birth, uh, address, permanent disability indicator, etc., and then you'll start an application for your school and your program. And as I say, keep in mind, you do this once a year. They'll want to know citizenship status, residency history. If you weren't born in Ontario, they will want detail about when did you move to Ontario, where were you before that, those kinds of details. From a student perspective, they want to know if you anticipate receiving any study period income, and they look at your assets. Study period income can be broken down into a couple of different things. One, scholarships, bursaries that you may be aware of when you apply. And two, I'll put that under earned income. You may want to take a part-time job or keep your part-time job. OSAC will ask you, and it'll be depending on whether you've applied for the fall only or fall winter, they'll ask if you anticipate having any earned income for the term. Keep in mind that for the four month time period, you can earn up to $5,600 before you even have to report it. So there is a fairly large window of opportunity, if that's something you feel you can do, to help with your meeting those costs, as I outlined earlier in the presentation, that, yep, I can take on a part-time job, and it's not going to affect my OSAP entitlement. These are changes that have been made over the past number of years to make it easier for students realizing that OSAP's not going to be enough to cover your educational costs. And so you're going to have to supplement it. And let's not be punitive or take away OSAP if you have another source of income. So keep that in mind. They will want your parents' income for 2018. This will be from their tax returns, from the notice of assessment that they've received from the Canada Revenue Agency. It, they will ask for specific lines on the OSAP, off, off the tax returns, to populate the information on the OSAP application. You'll have to provide signature and declaration pages for you and your parents. This is something that you, once you've completed your application and submitted it, it's gone through the first little bit. There will be a section on the OSAP application that says, okay, here are the required documents that you need to submit. You can download those. They'll give you a password to open them up. And there's signature and declaration pages for you and signature and declaration pages for your parents. Those need to be signed. And you can do a number of things with them after they're done. You can mail them into the financial aid office at the school you plan to attend. You can drop them off or you can scan them and upload them right back to the OSAP website, and that's where the schools as well will get back to the details that we need to and satisfy those pages online. You'll need to do this once. Don't have to do it every single year. If you're going to school this year, next year, the year after that, the signature and declaration pages are done only once. 
if you took a big break in the middle of it, took two years and then took a couple of years off and then came back to finish your studies, you will have to submit the signature pages again. But if it's continuous, it's once. The other thing is the MSFAA, and that's a Master Student Financial Aid Agreement. Also will be the second item on your required documents list that you may need, that you'll need to submit. And what that does, that's the document that goes to the National Student Loan Service Center. You'll be providing your banking information. Because if you're getting money from OSAP, and fees are paid directly to the institution and there's money left over in your first disbursement, it'll be deposited into your bank account. And so that's the area that you'll provide that information. You'll get an email from the National Student Loan Service Center telling you, hey, it's time to create your online account, time to provide the banking information on the online form, and in the required document section, they will give you an MSFAA number that is specific to you, that you will need to copy and use when you are doing that process as well. <coughs> Some of the changes that have happened from last year to this, based on the new government that we have in place, they have done some of the changes with OSAP to try to um, address the grant loan balance that was issued out uh, last year. Uh, last year the grants were higher. Um, in this particular example, the uh, free tuition was the word of the day last year or the year before. What it meant was that you, if your family income was $50,000 a year or less, you would receive grant money equal to the cost of the tuition on the lower end, $6,600. And so in essence, you got free tuition because you were given a grant that paid your tuition amount for you. It was nothing that you had to pay back. And what the provincial government did was they said, if your family income is going to be $50,000 a year or less, we're going to give you grant money only and no loan. Now, the federal government on their side did not have the same kind of approach and rules, so they would give you grant and loan but the provincial government would do grant only. Well, this year, they've added to that, they've brought the grants back down a little bit in proportion, and they will now issue loans as well. So depending on your eligibility, you may see I'm getting a federal loan, a federal grant, a provincial loan, and a provincial grant. And that'll be all very well outlined when you come, when you come with that. Student contribution, that's a, that's a concept in which OSAP is meant to supplement your resources, your parents' resources if you have them. There is an expected contribution from students. $3,600. It went from $3,000 to $3,600. So that, when they calculate costs and resources, that $3,600 is a fixed rate. They're not asking you for what did you earn during the summer? What did you earn in the four months prior to the school term? Um, you could have made $30,000 or $3,000. There's still a fixed rate contribution that they're going to be calculating in there on the expectation that you too have a job or savings or things, money that you're putting towards your own educational costs as well. They've changed a little bit of the expected parental contributions. Uh, things were going this way, that the higher your parental income, they were continually reducing the expected contribution. They just brought that back a couple of years. So you may see if you had an older sibling in school and see how their assessment was done last year or the year before, now you're getting to it and it may be completely different. They've adjusted a computer allowance, which is a cost that they built in, tuition, compulsory fees, books, a computer allowance, but just for first year only. It used to be for all four years, now it's just first year. OSAP expects that students and parents are contributing to the cost of their post-secondary education for the first four years of their life out of high school. So you come into university, coming in for the first time out of high school, your parents are expected to complete the OSAP application for the first four years. 
because you're considered a dependent student as far as OSAP is concerned. When we would hit the four-year mark, so your fifth year out of high school, previously you were considered an independent student and only you needed to complete the application form. So this is going to affect you, maybe not in this degree, but if you wanted to move on to graduate studies, OSAP has made the change. Now keep in mind it is only on the provincial side, but they measure independence as six years out of high school. So you may be starting the graduate program, and if you wanted to be eligible for all of the programs within OSAP, your parents would have to continue to complete the application forms. You can at that point make a choice and say, no, nope, I don't want my parents, I'm considered independent under the federal rules, I'm just going to take a smaller amount, but I don't need my parents to, to fill out the forms. So this is a, a bigger thing when it comes to understanding um, whether you're considered a dependent or independent student, there are certain expectations. The one that's been getting most of the attention and, um, and sometimes incorrectly is the grace period. Now I talked about OSAP and your loans and how you would need to start making payments on those loans when you're finished your program. Now there was a, there's a six month period. So let's say we're flash, fast forwarding four years, you're finishing your program and you finish your classes in April. There's a six month period before you have to start paying your student loans. No payments have to be made in that six month period. But here's now where the federal and the provincial government differ is when the interest starts to accumulate on those loans. This rule may very much change again. Um, when, the fed, when the provincial government brought in this rule, they were matching what the federal government was doing. And then when the federal budget came out a month later, the federal government reversed their position and now they're back this way again. They were aligned for a month. So what happens in this case is you're still not making any payments on your student loans for six months after you've finished but interest does accumulate on your provincial loans. And then you start making payments. Now it is the smaller portion of the loans that you would have been entitled to through the year, so it may not be as big um, as you think it might, but it, it is the concept of interest, no interest, payment, no payment, sometimes trips up a number of students. So. Your financial aid office is able to assist you with that kind of detail, and so is the National Student Loan Service Center. The tuition rates that I've indicated here and in my presentation is including the 10% reduction. So when this current provincial government came in, they indicated that tuition fees at all institutions needed to be reduced by 10%. So that is a bonus for you. It does, did not, will not cost this year what it cost students last year. So that is factored into any of the examples that I have at the moment. So we talked about whether OSAP was going to cover your costs and clearly when we've had a look at some of this, it doesn't. The maximum OSAP for eight months is $14,700. So you're seeing the big disconnect there already at the lower end of the fees at 217. How are you going to make up that shortfall? So OSAP is determined by calculating your costs, and you can see them down the list there on the left. So institutions like Waterloo, Conestoga, Laurier, we all feed information to the ministry, to the background, to say here's all of our programs and here's all of our costs. So when you choose your program from the list, when you start your OSAP application, all of those costs are already built in to the back end of the OSAP assessment. They assess for uh, the computer costs I indicated, living costs, um, et cetera. Living costs are not something that you provide them with. Based on the length of your first year program, there is an OSAP allowance. So whether you're living um, in an apartment or living in residence, you're given a, a rate per week for your shelter and living costs. 
Then they subtract any expected financial contributions. So we're looking at your student contribution, the 3,600. Based on the level of your parental income, there may be an expectation. Then spousal income if you are married, and then student and spouse's assets. What they don't ask for is parents' assets. So they don't, you don't need to report the value of the family home or what they may have in, in their bank account. None of that is reported. They also don't ask for RESP information. You may very well have them. That is an option. If your parents have put money aside in a registered education savings plan. But because OSAP bases their assessment on your parents' income, asking for RESP information is actually kind of duplicating what that calculation could be. So it's just based on income. One thing I did want to note is the application this year asks for 2018 income for your parents. If there's anyone in this situation, there is an appeal. Let's say there's been a retirement or a job loss or something in 2019, and the income for your parents is going to be lower than what was reported for 2018. You can speak to your financial aid office and have an appeal done so that your OSAP can be assessed on the lower income, which is more indicative of the family size and situation and the whole the financial situation there. So that type of appeal is available. So OSAP takes costs minus the contributions and calculates a financial need. So I've just got some sample assessments here for you. Just quick, this was using that estimator right at the beginning that I was talking about quickly on the OSAP application. So this is based on a, the lower end, an arts science program for two terms, rental income at $50,000. There are four people in the family with one at post-secondary. You can see the differences here living away from home. The student gets the full amount they're eligible for from OSAP with a grant loan split that's fairly even. Living at home, the costs are lower because the expectation is you're not paying for your room, your board, a residence, meal plan. Living at home is a lower cost option. Your grants and loans are again fairly similar. As we move up in the scale, adding another $20,000 to that total, you can see that the, every other parameter is the same. Art science program, family size of four, one at university or college. You get the same amount at 14.7, but you'll see the grant loan split has now changed. With a higher income, more loan than grant. Living at home is actually about $100 less, and the, and the split is even. When we move up to $90,000 a year, now the OSAP amount starts to come down because the higher the income, there is a larger parental expectation that they are contributing to your education, so your OSAP amount goes down, and now you can see again the split, where it's much less grant than loan, but you're still receiving money, which I think is the point to make at this point. Living at home, we're down at 5,900. Again, um, the loan higher than the grant. I took it up to $130,000 a year. I wanted to give you this as an example to say that even if the family income is $130,000 a year, or there is still financial assistance available to you through OSAP because of the level of the costs that you would be incurring. It is all loan at this stage, but there is financial assistance. So it's very hard to say, well, my family makes this much, how much money can we expect from OSAP? Because each situation is different. Um, what's your program? Are you living at home, away from home? How many are in the family? How many are at university? What's the total family interest that go into getting an end result? So I'll talk a little bit about some of the other resources available to you. I am using some specifics from the University of Waterloo, but this can be common at other institutions as well. So from an entrance perspective, we have, like many other institutions, a scholarship grid or a grid scholarship, as it's been referred to in others, where based solely on your academic average. We've been talking OSAP, and that's based on need. Scholarships are based on just your grades. 
And in this particular situation, we do have three levels of this grid scholarship available. It starts at 85%, and then there's an increments 90, and then 95 and above. So we assess this based on your admission average, which is what we just did last week with all of the remaining offers of admission that went out. We took a look at the grades that you had presented so far, final and mids, and came up with an admission average. We will check final grades in the summer, and if you have moved up a level with your final grade, then we will upgrade your scholarship. If you move slightly down in a level, we won't take that scholarship away, but you do have the opportunity if the grades go up to have it um, upgraded. There are other entrance scholarships, and we have a range from another $1,500 $1, awards that range from $500 up to $100,000. Most institutions will have on their financial aid website either a database or a list of scholarships, bursaries, and awards you can apply for. So most of these, where that first slide was based on grades only, these scholarships may require a bit more information. They may require, um, in Waterloo's case, an applicant information form. You may have had to do some of the math contests. Um, there may be other requirements that will be listed there, but then again, it's just mostly based on your grades. We offer a number of athletic awards, as most institutions do as well. So this is something that you're interested in getting involved with a varsity sports team. We do encourage you to speak to the athletics office or the, or the coach of that particular sport. There are athletic awards that you would may be eligible for. They're usually given out um, in late summer or, or during the fall and winter term. So they get their team established, they get um, the students involved with it, and then they may support awards in their winter term or even the following summer. So this is an opportunity if you were planning on doing that, that uh, we have about 350 student athletes that last year received an award of some type and amount. One thing to take a look at is not maybe just the institution that may have awards available to you, scholarships, bursaries, etc. Scholarships, grades, bursaries based on financial need, but there may be others that come with other different criteria. So check your whole high school guidance office. They may have a listing of scholarships that may be available or bursaries. Check with your local service organizations. Your, your parents may be involved with Lions Club or Kiwanis Club. They may have those types of awards. Your workplace, if you're working part-time, check to see if there are awards or scholarships based on your um, place of employment or your parents place of employment. They may have what they call employee dependent scholarships that they can apply for. Every, we're talking now sort of every little bit helps at this point. There are online scholarship catalogs or websites. These are not, um, are not housed at the schools, but these are large databases that get a lot of information on outside awards, etc. Not particularly tied to a school, but may be ordered, um, offered by other local organizations or others. And this scholarship database, I've given you three here, um, is something you can go into and say, I want to study in this program, I'd like to study at this school, or I'd like to put in their criteria, and it will give you options that you can apply for as well. Now what I'll do with this presentation, and I will give Dennis a copy as well, so that all of these links are here and all that information. So if there's things that you were thinking of and you go, what did she say? I'm sure she had a list. That presentation I'll make available so that uh, you can follow these links here. Bursaries are going to be based on financial needs. So these are like grants, non-repayable awards. It will probably come from the school. There are two kind of ways that the schools approach this. We do at Waterloo an automatic bursary, which is done at a number of schools as well. Those mostly factor in, though, where the student is in one of the higher fee programs, like computer science, engineering, upper year accounting programs. They have a much higher fee. Their OSAP in no way touches the amount of their fees. But these students are asked to provide a bit more detail, a bit more income information 
this is where the earnings from your work term, for example, or your summer term, may factor into additional assistance beyond OSAP. And so you provide that detail to OSAP, and then they provide the school with a file that says these students have a shortfall. They're, if you're going to, to put it bluntly, if, you're, if you as an institution are going to charge this much for your fees, and OSAP comes in here, you've got to help with that shortfall because these, this is a high fee program and these students need assistance. So we do get and send out a number of automatic bursaries to our students. Last year it was more, almost $11 million that was given out in bursary assistance to students in this, this particular situation. It is tied to your OSAP application, so you've got to follow up and complete all of the details with that. But if you're not in a high fee program, we still do have a bursary program. And there was almost five and four and a half million dollars given out last year to students who were in arts and science and environment programs, the regular base tuition fees, but they filled out a paper application. Because as we've determined here, and you can see this is done because it's done with institutional costs. OSAP is kind of an across the board thing where you get a living allowance, whether you're living in Waterloo or in Kingston or in Toronto, it's all the same. When a school approaches a bursary and financial need, they're actually taking a look at the costs for that particular location, that particular school, in relationship to what the OSAP is giving you. So they've created budgets and information that says, well, this is what it costs to live in Waterloo, or this is what it costs to live in Toronto. How can we help these students? Again, we're talking about budget, right? The costs, the resources. How do we get the two things to match? So a paper application is available. I'm going to touch a little bit on student and family contributions. It's been a topic that has come up throughout the presentation as well. But student contributions can be your summer savings. They can be if you're in a co-op program, any savings from your co-op work term. It can be part-time employment during your study period. That fixed rate contribution, as far as OSAP is concerned, can be any combination of all of this. If you list zero on the application form, you will still be charged the flat rate student contribution. Family contributions can be a number of things. OSAP does calculate an expected amount based on your family income, but it could be savings, it could be an RESP that they've given money into over the years. If you're home for the summers, one of the way parents can help is don't charge free room and board. Or, or charge, <laughs> what am I trying to say? Offer free room and board. Don't charge the student, well now that you're at school and working, you can pay me some rent and, and food money. Well, where parents can help is they can say, no, that expectation isn't there. As long as you're still a full-time student, any monies that you make and save will put towards your education. There will need to be some planning and budgeting, and this is the kind of thing that has to happen continuously. You can't just create a budget and leave it. It is a living document because costs may change, your resources may change, how are you going to make it there? One of the things to note is that Aeroplan and TD, Canada Trust Travel Points, are also something that can be redeemed for to pay your fees. So if mom and dad have some aeroplan points they're not using, grandma and grandpa have aeroplan points that they're not using, there is a program called Higher Ed Points. You can sign up, log in, and depending on the amount of points available, that will trans translate into money that you can apply towards your fees. The federal and the provincial governments are also on board as well, so if it comes time to paying your student loans at the end of your academic career, these same points can be cashed in, if you will, to make payments towards your outstanding student loans. So kind of an unexpected um, set of resources in that particular area, but certainly something we're seeing more prevalent. And I would say probably most schools in Ontario, colleges and universities are signed on with this higher end points. So this is a list of just the websites that I've pointed to and talked about during our presentation. There's Waterloo site for future students, our student awards and financial aid, OSAP, 
the National Student Loan Service Center, that's canlearn.ca. What's interesting about that website is they do have a repayment calculator. So if you're looking at saying, well, you know, if I got $15,000 in student loans, how, what are my payments going to be? What, how, what, how long is it going to be for me to pay that back? Uh, what's the interest rates, etc.? So you can go on to that repayment calculator and play around with those numbers and say, do I want to pay it off in five years, two years, the maximum 10 years? And it'll give you an idea of what your options might be. The other two are part of the uh, scholarship databases that I had. And the last one is, is a resource that we found very handy and talked to uh, students about is the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. And it is a federal, from a financial literacy, literacy perspective, this is an interesting site to take a look at because it focuses not only on funding for post-secondary, but it's budgeting to begin with. What about a credit card? It helps you through various stages of your life as well. Okay, I'm looking at buying a house. What does that mean? And so points you to resources and calculators and workbooks and other things that may help you in making some of these large financial decisions that you'll be taking a look at over the next few years. So I think, yes, that is it for all I wanted to say. But I'm more than happy to take any questions if you had something that I didn't explain enough, well enough. Happy to take any questions. Okay, I will also hang around a little bit afterwards, because I know there may be some who else want to ask a question, not in front of the group. So, I will be here as well. Did everybody get a chance to put their name in the bucket? I brought some uh, little draw prizes today, so...